see all the chats popping up. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming to the Extended Techniques and Commissioning New Music panel. This is really exciting to see everyone. Wow, everyone's chatting away. <laughs> um, let's give everyone a few seconds to join. We should be live now on Facebook. Let's check and make sure that we yep, are. We should be good. Yep, everything looks good. Let everyone pop on here. Wow, there's quite a few of people. That's great. So we can go ahead and start. Um, I think Jessica and I can introduce ourselves. If this is the first panel out of the two that we have so far done, then welcome to ICA Plays On. This is the International Clarinet Association's first virtual event, and we're really excited to have you all here today with us, watching with some wonderful clarinetists from around the world. So my name is Jenny McClay, and I'm the social media coordinator for the International Clarinet Association. I'm the one that shares all your wonderful videos, photos, and tries to answer all the questions you have. So it's nice to see all of you today. Hi, I'm Jessica Harry. I'm the executive director of operations with the ICA. So if you've had a question and you've emailed edo at clarinet.org, you're speaking with me. Um, and you can continue to do that. That's my job. So please feel free to reach out. Um, and if you're a vendor and you haven't um, sent me information, um, for the virtual exhibit hall, be sure to do that and I can add you while we have a panel. And before I forget, I'm going to try and remember to do this at all the different panels. Um, mention the virtual exhibit hall, which I'm really excited about. Jessica put that together. We also have a store on Threadless if anyone wants some cool ICA merchandise. There's t-shirts. There's Someone ordered a beach towel earlier this morning, so whoever's at the beach, I'm jealous. Uh, but we have a lot of things that you can look and order. And then if everyone wants to go around and introduce yourself, tell us about, you know, your journey so far as a clarinetist, keep it a little bit brief because I know we'll have some questions, but where you are based, what you teach, um, why you got into extended techniques, that would be wonderful. Any order? You just want to, I'll start. Go first, Bob. Am I still being heard? Yeah. I teach at Arizona State University, and actually, it's it's I will make the short version of how I got involved in in, in all this to begin with. Um, when I started teaching college, I was really young; I was 24, and I was teaching in Greg State in Iowa, at, at little college, Morningside College in Sioux City, and I realized that in order to compete with anybody else in the state, Greg wasn't there then, um, that I. I had to do something different than everybody else was doing. And, and I went to a bunch of recitals. We used to have this Iowa clarinet day. And I went to all the recitals and everybody was playing Brahms and Poulenc and Sansons and stuff like that. And I thought there is no way I'm ever going to make a name unless I figure out something that I can do differently than other people. And at that point, I started getting involved in, 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 in new music and trying to commission people. And in the beginning, just finding pieces that, that would work for me. There was a man who uh, ran a music store in South Sioux City, Nebraska. And he found that if he ordered a, a new piece along with a bunch of Weber concertinos or whatever else, he primarily sold to kids who were playing music at solo and ensemble contests. If he did that, then he could sell more the music cheaper and make more of a, a profit. So nobody bought that other stuff. So he, he put it in a Coors beer box. He called it Bob's Bin. And when it got to a certain point, he'd call me and he'd say, I have some music you need to look at. And one of the very first pieces I bought was a piece that the International Clarinet Society actually commissioned. And it was called Passage, well, it still is called Passages of the Beast by uh, Morton Sobotnik. And it was a very, very early piece using a lot of extended techniques, quarter tones, multiphonics. And you had, you, you had to have a pickup for your clarinet that you ran into a, something he called a ghost box, which changed your signal. Like It was like even a little after the pitch writer, where he it took a signal and turned your acoustical signal into a MIDI, MIDI signal. And the really cool thing about it was just an amazing piece. But um, I got to the last page. It took me three months to learn it. It's really hard. And I got to the last, last couple of pages, and I realized that I had to double tongue because it had 16th notes at 184. And there was no way I was going to play 16th notes at 184. So I had to learn to double tongue. So I called my brother Tom, who is, was getting a trumpet degree at Michigan, and I said, you know, how do you double tongue? And he said, well, you go ticka, 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 ticka. So I went and got my clarinet and went ticka, ticka, and it was squeaky, 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 squeaky. So... I had to learn how to do that. And actually the first article I ever had published was in the clarinet magazine uh, right after that period of time. And um, it was a double tongue method because it took me so long to learn how to do it. So that's how I kind of got involved in it was by just necessities of mother of invention. 
And from that, it just got more and more exciting as you learn more techniques and as you learn more, more ways to expand the palette of sounds that we have in the clarinet. And then, of course, the other one, and then I'm done, was when I first met the music of, of William o. Smith. And when I met Bill Smith's music, I found it in a, in a, a music store in New York called Padleton's, which I don't believe exists anymore. In fact, I know it doesn't. And I found variants, and it was just like blew my mind wide open. You know, I went to Michigan, which was kind of the bastion of conservatism at that time. Nobody did any multiphonics or anything like that. And it was just so crazy, and it just the world opened. That's it. Mute me. All right, I'll, I'll come back in. Since Bob had talked about me, I'll kind of pick that up. Um, I'm Greg Oaks. I teach at Iowa State University, and I also play in the Des Moines Symphony. Um, I got into new music because um, I actually, the first thing that made me really excited was hearing Eric Mandat uh, perform his folk songs at the ICA uh, convention in Minneapolis. And the piece was only a couple years old at the time. And I said, uh, I don't even know what I just heard, but I want to do that all the time. And so uh, I decided I was going to, uh, and, and I, uh, I studied with Elsa Berger at Michigan State. And, uh, and she, of course, is a huge proponent of new music. Um, and I learned a lot of the extended technique things uh, in my time there. Um, and also, similar to what you said, Bob, um, I felt like there were so many people doing a really beautiful job of all the other stuff and had been for so long. I felt like adding a little drop of my voice to um, the, the huge deluge of, of wonderful music there wasn't very interesting. So um, my favorite thing to do is to commission new things. And uh, in fact, actually, I just had a new clarinet um, made. Um, this is my quarter tone extended clarinet um, that has quarter tones that go all the way down to the bottom of the instrument and, uh, and also across the middle. If anyone's ever tried to play um, a D quarter flat, you, you know the pain. So <laughs> this instrument now, um, I've commissioned six composers to write pieces for it. And um, you would have heard two of them this weekend, um, but I'll play them for you guys another time. Hey, Greg, are the, the fingerings on that? I mean, it's extremely difficult. I mean, I've seen you with pictures of that on Facebook and everything. It's, it's, it, it, it works, the, all the fingerings can work like a standard clarinet, except there is a, where there's that normal, the F correction fingering location, that is an F quarter sharp slash C quarter sharp. And then there's also a, um, a thumb a key here, which will, which will raise the, uh, which will raise the uh, F sharp, G, and G sharp, all quarter tones. Wow. And, so, and the F hey, Greg, let me. Go let ahead. me interrupt right um, uh, quickly. If you have a demonstration of that that you want to share a video that you've maybe already made, we could share that on our pages for anyone curious, or I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you wanted to put a demonstration now, we seem to be getting a lot of comments saying, what is that? What is that? Probably the best Greg. To show you show you some of these sounds here. I'm not going to play a whole piece. I'm just going to play some of these low things so you can hear what it sounds like. <laughs> Those tones didn't exist until about six months ago. So the low parts, and of course the uh, the fifth above. An area that was so terrible that if you were working with composers, you had to say like, don't, don't write there now. I actually have specific tone holes that are just for those notes. And actually uh, now the worst quarter tone is now a big quarter flat. So <laughs> it changes and now, and now those are the best quarter tones on the instrument because they're dedicated tone holes for it. I'm driving to Iowa to steal it from your house tonight. We had a question, <laughs> um, we had a couple questions. Uh, who helped you um, get this instrument working in this manner? Uh, Wolfgang Loaf uh, from Loaf and Pfeiffer did the work for me. And, uh, and so I actually went to Copenhagen in January, picked it up and, and we dialed in and did some of the the fine tuning from that. Um, I got it in just under the wire <laughs> before I wasn't going to be able to go from hanging anymore. So. Who's going next to introduce themselves and tell us about your journey with extended techniques? I'll go. So I'm Rachel Yoder. I'm also the editor of the journal for the Clarinet Association, was on the call earlier. 
which was really fun. So I, um, I didn't really come from a classical music family. Um, so when I got to college for my undergraduate degree in music education, I kind of felt like, and maybe some of you were in the same boat, that um, there was all this, all these, you know, hundreds of years of tradition weighing on me in learning this uh, classical repertoire. And I found it really challenging and kind of, I felt a little bit like an outsider. And then I started hanging out with composers and um, I realized like I can, they can write a piece for me. I can play it however I want. Um, I can be the first one to interpret this and really it can be something that's, that's alive and that's here right now. And I just uh, really kind of found my voice as a performer uh, through that. I ended up marrying a composer, uh, Greg Dixon, and we have a duo together, clarinet and electronics duo called Odd Partials. And so we do some interactive music and improvisation with that group and some commissioning projects. And then uh, I play with the, here I live in Seattle, I uh, play with the Seattle Modern Orchestra a lot. <clears throat> and um, since I moved here, I got to have the great honor of getting to know William O. Smith and working with him on some of his music. And he ended up writing a couple of pieces to me. So I got some wonderful coaching from him on uh, especially multiphonics and how to approach some of the extended techniques in his pieces. I have to say, I saw Rachel play one of those pieces at Bill's 92nd birthday, I think it was, and, and it just knocked me completely on my rear end. It was so incredible. <laughs> so the playing was beautiful and the piece was just incredible. Well, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I got to work with him every week over the summer the, for the past two summers, so I'm really missing that this summer and uh just want to say hi bill <laughs> we miss you <laughs> bill passed away at the end of uh february mm -hmm. we can go sure so as as rachel uh was saying neither one of us really had a musical family growing up um so we got to experience all this fresh uh, in, in high school and in college. And, um, you know, like others have said, I think we, we Stephanie and I both, I'm not going to speak for you, but we enjoy the music, especially uh, Eric Mandat's music, what he's done uh, for, for us in terms of uh, branching things out, as well as, as uh, Bill Smith. Um, my my interest has kind of taken a, a different path and it's really hard because of anything to be um that I can tell the so I was curious about about uh what Tom is doing and what what's role is in in and um it's not really it was just hey, curious Josh, Josh, Josh you're breaking up for everybody can you hear us now yeah can you start over <laughs> Sorry. Make sure there were. Okay. Just saying that my, my, uh, my interest in extended techniques can be. So, what if I else? Let's go to, let's move to somebody else and we'll come, back. Come, come back to us. I can jump in if that's okay. Um, my name is Andy Hudson. I teach at UNC Greensboro um, in North Carolina and um, do a good bit of chamber playing and I can be heard, right? Yeah. Okay, great. I'm just wondering if I too am going through the robot filter. Um, do a good bit of playing in contemporary chamber music, um, do a lot of working with composers in university settings and, and commissioning on my own. Um, and I have, I have kind of a funny story. I, I had an amazing undergraduate experience at Columbus State University in Georgia with Lisa Oberlander who is building an army of, of contemporary clarinetists. Um, and I remember as a freshman sitting in the concert hall, watching her play Lee Hyla's We Speak Etruscan. 
and just being completely mesmerized by this piece. I'd never heard anything like it. And when the piece was over, I erupted to my feet clapping and looked around and like 20 people had left during the piece. <laughs> <laughs> and I asked her afterwards about that and she said, that's how you know you really nailed it at a new music concert. <laughs> so I couldn't shut up about this piece and a buddy of mine in the studio said, I got something you have to see. And late at night, he took me into a back viewing room in the music library. We got a VHS, put it in, and he showed me a video of Bob playing Eric Mandat's Subterrains of Stratospheres, this piece. And I never heard anything like it. And I decided in that moment, I'm going to learn how to circular breathe right now. And I'm going to study with Bob Spring this summer in Belgium. So I tried to circular breathe and I did not succeed for four months. I get to Belgium. I can't do it. And of all pieces, I'm playing Brahms Sonata for Bob in my first lesson. And he's like trying to get me to make this phrase and he's just in my face and I'm trying to be musical. I'm like 17, 18, I'm a kid. And I circular breathed in desperation because I didn't want to break the phrase in Brahms. And he looks at me and says, well, I can do it without circular breathing. And I said, you have no idea what just happened. This is amazing. And he said, what, you never circular breathed before and you waited until you played Brahms? So ever since then, I find that extended techniques not only open the possibilities for new music that's being written, but they also give us new opportunities to reinterpret existing works and to tackle existing problems. Um, I want to give a shout out to my doctoral student, who I think is in the chat, Lucas Giannini, and he's working on research about how to use extended techniques to correct common problems in traditional ways. So it's sort of interesting to work backwards and see how can we fix common issues with, with, with things that used to be mistakes. So I, I just, I think that the clarinet, especially the extended technique ecosystem is so musical and so rich. And I just, I just can't get enough of trying new stuff and, and making new sounds. So that's kind of my journey and it intersects with so many of the people on this screen. So it's pretty fun to see you all here. It's funny because like talking about phonics, how they can actually solve problems because if you're having a, a hard time with the altissimo, learning how to control the oral cavity is something that'll help with that. And I've always felt the double tonguing actually helped my single tongue. Because it Definitely. was made you aware of it. And it always cracks me up because when I was at Michigan, they said, oh, don't do that stuff. That will ruin your sound. And the truth is, it, it just so much enhances what you're doing. Everybody plays multiphonics. They just think it's the first note of the clarinet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think like flexibility, like, you think about like professional dancers, like they're incredibly strong, but they're also incredibly flexible. You know, and I think that's musically what we want. We want to be as flexible as we can. Josh, you want to try now? Is this any better? Yes. We moved to a hardwired connection. I guess our Wi-Fi is not doing so great today. Is this still okay? I'm a little paranoid about it now. Okay. So we'll just start over. Uh, it, as, as other people have said, uh, I've had uh, a, a, um, a deep appreciation and uh, enjoyment of a lot of the music that um, has been has been written exploring these techniques particularly the music of, uh, of uh, <laughs> thanks Andy uh, uh, Eric Mandat's music and um, as I was becoming more and more exposed to it because it, as, as I tried to mention before you know Stephanie nor I really had much of a, a musical family growing up uh, so it was you know a, fresh learning experience um, for us. We tried to just take in as much as we possibly could. Um, but a lot of these extended techniques, it, as, as, as I um, started a, a exploring them, you realize that there's, there's so much that happens in the oral cavity and uh, so much of, of, of that function is necessary for a lot of these techniques to work. Um, it, led me down a research path to investigating what was going on. It all started, uh, I was doing my doctorate with Bob and uh, we were having a conversation about double tonguing. And um, I kind of thought it felt like this. And he said, well, I think it feels like th that. And so I said, well, let's, let's see what, what's, what in the world is going on. And, um, so that that was the beginning of a, a journey that I'm I'm very much still on. Um, you know, I, I teach with Bob at ASU. You know, we have big big ten year anniversary coming up next year, and uh, I run a research lab. And one of the primary things that we do is uh, 
examining what the what the tongue is doing, and I'm, I'm not sure if it, it'd be possible to share any of that with you uh, today. But but if if so, I have some some fun videos of what the tongue's up to during doing a lot of these extended techniques. Um, I might add that Josh is. But his entire research was to be able to prove me wrong. Did I? Yes. <laughs> and I mean, if you haven't seen some of Josh's videos, we use them in lessons at UNCG all the time to make students aware of some of the nuances of what's happening. It's, it's pretty remarkable stuff. Yeah, it really is. I mean, and the use of ultrasound versus, we started looking at this when Ray Wheeler uh, published his stuff and it was considered so outlandish at the time, you know, the whole idea that the oral cavity moves that he couldn't even get it published. I mean, the clarinet magazine wouldn't publish it. He had to get it published in the NACWAPI journal and this you know, little black and white journal because the clarinet magazine said, no, this is not right. And now it's obviously been proven to be correct. Well, unfortunately, I mean, there's still, there's still a lot of controversy and um, you know, with ultrasound, it's super easy and non-invasive. So we don't have to irradiate anybody to see what their tongue is doing. I laughed because I was doing a master class at a very, very conservative school. And then I showed Josh's video and, and I said, now this is really what's happening in the mouth. And the teacher said, well, I can see that it's happening, but should it? <laughs> and it was like, what, what century are we in? You know, Sarah hasn't talked yet. Well, it's, it's definitely one thing. Yeah. So I've always been attractive to new music, um, especially commissioning music. Josh and I are in two ensembles that are fairly new. The Reed Quintets is in its infancy hasn't been around very long. So of course we have to commission new music for that ensemble. And a lot of times we get extended techniques written for us or pieces where you have to circular breathe and you have to double tongue or you have to play microtones and multiphonics. And it's just always very exciting to see what we're gonna get. You just never know. Um, also with our duo, we commission new pieces, um, several um, about, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the primary focus of the, the commissions are um, social justice issues. Uh, but, you know, these composers, they write for, as, as is the case for everybody here right now, the uh, composers writing for the things that they know we can do based on the, the, the relationships that we've built with them. And consequently, you know, we, we get some of these techniques that, I mean, we don't even consider much of them extended anymore because it's just a standard part of what we do. And, and the problem is, as soon as you do it, or anybody does it, then the next composer sees that and says, oh, clarinet can do, can do that. And all of a sudden, what was an extended technique is no longer extended. What it is now is just, I mean, I, I tell students who say, well, I, <clears throat> circular breathing is an extended technique. No, when you go to a clarinet convention and see Ricardo Morales circular breathe, it's no longer an extended technique. It's just part of what we do. Yeah, Sarah should go. Sarah should go. Sarah. Hey, hi, from the UK, which means it's evening and it's gin and tonic time. So, <laughs> cheers, so yeah, I think like a tip for everyone, like how did we get into contemporary music? Um, I mean, it's literally because I really didn't know how to say no uh, when I was younger. And you soon learn how to say no, I think, with new music. Um, but right from school, I was working with student composers. And then I went to the Royal Academy of Music. And a composer said, oh, will you play my piece for me? And I said, oh, yeah, of course. When's the concert? And he said, tomorrow. And, um, you know, you have no choice. You do it. And once somebody knows you do contemporary music, then they ask you and they ask you more. And then I ended up... Um, you know, falling in love with the bass clarinet. And at that point, this is like 98, 99, in the UK, you couldn't get music for bass clarinet. You would go into a, a shop and there would be no music at all. And so I had to ask people to start writing for me. And that just continued and continued. And then I found there were lots of problems, uh, like there was no proper resource for bass clarinet multiphonics nothing was accurate and I just got so fed up with playing pieces that didn't work that I ended up doing a, a doctorate in bass clarinet multiphonics 
And then people started writing using my charts. So we have like many pieces now that use my charts. And, and then I didn't want to stop there. I wanted to get bigger. So I got the Contra Base Counter a few weeks, a few years ago. And so now the pieces are getting bigger as well. And the multiphonics are getting wider apart. So um, yeah, I think if there's any kind of college students out there, I think never ever say no. Always say yes and you'll be good. I have to say I went to a recital in, in Italy that Sarah and did and then also Jason and uh, who's on the, the, the thing here and it was and I, it just blew me away. It was uh, I took a video of it and I sent it to Josh and Stephanie and I said my god I'm in heaven this is amazing. I remember one of my first concerts I did with my Base clarinet multiphonic research. It was in Ghent um, at one of the European conferences. And I remember Bob Spring and Eric Mandat were there. And I was playing some of my multiphonic pieces in a tiny theater, blacked out with curtains, no ceiling. And I was like, oh my God, they're not going to work. They're not going to work. I'm going to look such an idiot. And I was so pleased because everyone came out. And Bob, I think it was you. It might have been Eric. And it, one of you came up to me at the end and they were like, I came into the room and I saw the acoustics. I saw your program. I saw it's multiphonics. And I thought, oh my God, she's deep. <laughs> <laughs> And I remember, I am sure it was you, Bob, who said that to me. Probably. Then, yeah, so, a nice story. <laughs> so, I thought we would start with some questions. I've been seeing some pop in the chat. Um, we're going to get to those. How about we start with what extended techniques, I've seen some people debate the term extended techniques for the purpose of this panel. We'll keep using extended techniques. But what extended techniques do you think everyone should know and how should you approach those? Let's pretend that there's a clarinetist that wants to learn these skills. What advice would you give for someone to start out? Are there any books or resources? I think there's a piece that, that we use with a lot of our students are, who are trying to start and that's uh, Ron Caravan's Excursions for Clarinet, which was quite old now, 1975 or 76 or something like that, but it has everything in it. It has multiphonics that I think you'll all agree are fairly easy to produce. And it has quarter tone fingerings in it. It has a section you could actually multiple tongue if you wanted to or circular breathe through it. So it, it gives you a, 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 a way to start to, at the beginning. We've actually, Josh and I have talked about this a lot and we had one of our doctoral students just finish her paper where she commissioned five composers, including Eric, to write pieces that would be She's, her whole premise was that you have Osborne Rhapsody, then you have folk songs. <laughs> and, and what do you have in between there? And so she had five composers write, was it five, Josh? Yeah, five composers write pieces that all had something in it. Quarter tones, multiphonics, um, uh, rubato, uh, and then Eric's, I can't remember, all, and Eric combined them all. Her name is Katrina Clements, and you can look that up. Her, her pieces are marvelous, and they also will work to help with that. I just think that at the, at the beginning, if you say one thing like multiphonics or something else, I think flexibility would be the, the, the word to come up with. When I hear Greg Oakes play, he, he's like the most flexible player I've ever heard in my life. I mean, I'll, I'll never forget in Nebraska when, when you played that piece, unfortunately the, the, the music fell over, but he was playing this piece that I just, I kept sitting there looking at him. It wasn't Nebraska. And I kept looking at you thinking, my God, this man has the flexibility of Houdini. This is just incredible to watch this. I think flexibility is the biggest thing to start with. I mean, getting their tongue unlocked from the back. I mean, you know, they're used to, oh, we have to hold it in this position all the time. No, you don't. That's I think it. Great. That's the flexibility. Oh. You're right. And, and I think multiphonics is one of the great ways that you can create that because you're, you're understanding what you can do. And um, I talk about multiphonics as a, a fantastic way to really improve flexibility and, and response. I love playing really, really softly. It's one of my favorite things on the clarinet. Um, and in order to do that, you have to really know exactly how to voice every single thing. And when you understand multiphonics well, you won't grunt because that's, it's just not the right note. That's not a G, that's a, a G dyad. And, and so when, I think that that's exactly right, Bob, like flexibility. And so because of that, I think multiphonics are excellent way to get people started. You use the same fingerings, you just understand how to voice things. 
we had another, an easy another way to doctor. start is to, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Bob. No, I just just say we had another doctoral student named Jack Liang who published this whole fingering chart as well using, a, a, what were they primarily diets, Josh? And, and that, that, it goes from easy to hard. It's, it's really incredible. I'm sorry, Andy, go ahead. No, I, I was just going to say, I think improvisation is a great way to first encounter these. Like I encourage my students just to like, like put your, put your close away and just mess around for a half hour. And when you make mistakes, try to repeat them and you'll start to discover different sounds that are available to you. And I think there's something really powerful about sort of organically arriving <coughs> at, oh, wow, two notes just came out. I wonder if I could make that happen. Or, oh, I squeaked or oh, these notes slid together. Like, I wonder what happened. Um, or if you're, if you're tonguing poorly, like, Maybe, maybe tongue as poorly as you can first and see what happens, you know? I, I think there's all kinds of ways to organically just get, you know, if the effects are the goal, like before you even deploy them musically, just deploy them in your own improvisation. Yeah. I let people talk about squeaks in my studio. I, I, as soon as people start to talk about squeaks, I stop and say, ah, they're unanticipated upper partial harmonics. <laughs> because the clarinet's doing what you're telling it to you, you just don't know it. Yeah, that level of experimentation is just so, it's so critical. We, we, we're afraid of, you know, we don't want to make a, a mistake, but sometimes those mistakes really open doors for figuring out what's really going on, how to avoid things, and how to do new things. We really encourage our students to, to explore those mistakes so that, you know, they can, they can try to get a better idea of what's going on because it's so hard to know what's going on in the mouth. We're terrible at knowing what's going on in the mouth. Uh, so if, if we can get an idea of what it feels like, we're going to be in much better shape. Josh posted the right uh, paper. It was not uh, Katrina Clements. It was Olivia Meadows. Um, but we would have, uh, bef back before we had this whole situation with ultrasound and knowing what's going on, we had a doctor on campus who, in the speech and hearing clinic, Jim Case. He's passed away now, but he would put a little fiber optics tube in your mouth. So you could see what the tongue was doing, and primarily for the front of the tongue. And Josh said, we don't know what our, tongue is, our tongues are doing. Be, oh, man, we would get all these orchestras come to town. They used to have this Great Orchestras of the World series on campus. And we'd grab the clarinetist and say, hey, could you come with us for a few minutes after the concert? And we'd have this guy stay late, and they'd put this tube in their mouth, and we'd say, now, where do you tongue? And they'd say, well, I tongue on the tip of my tongue. And then you'd find they're tonguing down here someplace, or here, or here, or here. We have no idea what's going on in our mouths. I think I, um, I also say to a lot of my students to effectively do contemporary techniques and get color into your playing, you have to destroy your nice, perfect classical technique. So you end up going to music college where you end up spending like a year learning how to play Mozart with a really, really beautiful sound. But then because you have a really, really beautiful sound, you can't play a multiphonic because you just become so tight with your embouchure. And to be able to play contemporary technique you have to throw your good technique back in the bin and you have to remember all of the bad habits you had when you started the clarinet and once like you know students realize that then the techniques start to actually come out really really well so just like ignore everything your teachers have said and you'll be able to play multiphonics i think that building on that i think it's a it's a wonderful way to to get maybe a a, a sound for the older repertoire that perhaps you even prefer. Um, I one one fall um, we were uh, doing a concert with Des Moines Symphony, and we did I think maybe Pines of Rome or Rachmaninoff Second Symphony. Anyway, um, this bass player from the section came up and said, "Ow, you, you're doing something different. Did you get a new mouthpiece?" I'm like, "Well." Uh, I was practicing more, <laughs> but I was spending the summer thinking about voicing, and that's and that's all. It's all that. So rather than getting some lockdown thing, like Sarah's saying, like bringing more in, and if you're constantly investigating and exploring that, I think that you might find something that might even be preferable to the received wisdom, just hearing and understanding. Rachel, hold up the book that you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I was going to do some show and tell. So. I don't know about you all, but this was kind of my Bible when I started out because my teachers didn't. Some of the, well, I shouldn't say that. I did have teachers that knew the techniques I wanted to do, but not always. So, yeah, great basic resource. My pages are falling out of mine, and I need to, like, get it bound or something. But uh, the, what I use most in here still is the quarter tone fingering chart. 
and the multiphonic fingering charts, just basic references when I need a fingering or I need to make a choice uh, for a piece, I'll just go to this as a quick reference. And I've printed out some other ones that people have been putting together over the years as well. I want to give a plug also. Um, all of those multiphonics in the Rayfield book, I recorded and put into a database that I also indexed um, in a searchable way. So you can look up uh, not only the multiphonic, but you can say what multiphonics have A's in them, what multiphonics are category one, two, three, and great belt. Um, so you can also, composers like it because you can say, oh, hey, I want something built on an A, and then they can look and see what ones are on there. It's, most of it is information from the Ray Felton I've added from other places, but it's, it's indexed in a way that you can search it. And so um, my website, gregoryoaks.com, has a link up in the upper right-hand corner. Um, and also has fingerings for microtones, if anyone wants to check that out. One of the other things that we found with, with the, sorry, Jenny, just a second, <laughs> that we found with, with younger students is that, is that when, you, when you introduce, the earlier you can introduce this, I mean, everything, if everything is set, you know, if their arms are set and everything, the earliest you can introduce this, the earlier you introduce it, the more flexible they become. And, and it's just incredible. And the more open-minded they become. So all of a sudden they're bringing pieces, pieces into you that you've never seen before or my friend just wrote this for me and that's that's i think the whole creative aspect that we're trying to teach i mean if we're not teaching clones we're, we're teaching creative people i was just going to jump in here and say i put this in the chat but if anyone has any resources that they want shared after this event please email them to me assistant at clarinet.org i'm going to put together a big list of all of these pieces videos books every kind of resource that we're all <laughs> mentioning so please email me Sometime next week, I'm going to try and post that on social media and get that out. So anything that you think is relevant, I'll post it everywhere I can, just so everyone has this in one place. Thanks, Jenny. The other thing is, it's unfortunately, since we're not together in Reno, we can't do this. But the other thing is, whenever you see something, a young player in particular, when they go to a clarinet convention, I, mean, I started going in the 70s, and I heard stuff that I just couldn't believe. And I think going to a, a concert where you're seeing a new piece will open your your mind. I mean, I was I was so closed until I finally heard some of this stuff and it just, it opened me to things I just simply didn't know existed. And like Rachel, I mean, Bill Smith did some wonderful things for me too. And and and, the, and not to the extent that I didn't get to see him every Friday like you did, but but I mean, he his, his music and looking at his music, all of it, from the double clarinet to the multiphonics to everything. I mean, just the exploration of new sounds is so incredible. What I think we offer a composer with like an extended universe is the, we, we basically remove the limitations from what they want to write. I premiered this amazing piece by Lita Fink for solo low reed instruments. So I guess it could be anything. I played it on bass clarinet, but she's trying to capture like Appalachian vocal sounds. And so she has the bass clarinet humming and, and vocalizing while playing. And all of a sudden you get these <coughs> kind of haunted effects that would not be considered standard practice, but they just get her closer to the music she hears in her head. And so I think that's really exciting for for me as a performer to think I can give this composer closer to what they want by just taking the lid off and say, well, you just write it and we'll, we'll figure it out. That's cool. That's the thing that, that is exciting for me. Actually, the thing that uh, made me want to create this quarter tone extended clarinet um, is uh, Ken Wayno, who teaches out at uh, UC Berkeley, um, had written a concerto for me, um, clarinet with wind ensemble, and he had these low F quarter sharps. And I said, hey, cool, but you know, it's not on the instrument. And he said, but wasn't it be cool? And I got to thinking, yeah, yeah, that would be cool. So sometimes the, the technique exists first and sometimes the idea exists first. And, and ho hopefully we're all interacting with composers just you know, like Stadler you know, or uh, Mufelt, you know, and hopefully we can contribute something to the inspiration. Sarah mentioned, and so did Josh, you have to practice these techniques. And I had a one time, a, a guy flew in from a, a pretty big university on the other side of the country, flew to Arizona, and he wanted to learn how to multiple tongue. So we had this lesson in the morning on a Saturday, and we sat down and we worked for about an hour and I explained the process and what he needed to do. And, and, and I, he said, well, I still can't do it. And I said, well, you're, you're gonna have to practice it. And he said, I don't wanna practice that. Can we go play golf now? So, I mean, it's, it's like, you really do have to work on these things. And that's part of it. And, and I know that I just include it as part of my warm up every day. And it's just part of what you do. Just go through 
you play your scales, thirds and arpeggios and long tones or whatever, and then and then just do some double tonguing, some single tonguing, double tonguing, and it just then becomes part of your musical vocabulary. And a lot of these things, they, they're easy to implement into a, you know, a daily warm up, And, you know, before long, they become automatic. If you need to double tongue, you double tongue. Yes, you don't? Circular breathe your scales every day. and becomes yeah. second nature to you. Yeah. It's not one of those, yeah, circular breathing especially is one of those things, and double tonguing, I would say. One, they're techniques that if you don't practice, they do go away. Um, so just like articulation, if you don't practice tonguing, yeah, and you need to build up your endurance on those as well. Yeah. And quarter tones, for that matter, um, people kind of get used to saying like, oh, if it's just, it's not a B or a C, it's somewhere in between, that's a B quarter sharp. And violinists would be like, <laughs> aren't you cute? Uh, <laughs> uh, really learning to practice quarter tones, I realized humblingly um, I was not playing them in tune at even close, you know, sometimes I was, I was a full eighth tone off, which, I mean, you're like, well, how much is that? It's like, well, it's like if you're thinking about half steps, but it's also really interesting. You start to realize that people have some of these fake fingerings and stuff like that. It's like, oh, we can just use this as a trill. It's like, that's, that's a really, really perfect quarter tone rather than the, the half step that you think. And so that's another instance where practicing something like uh, quarter tones will really improve your intonation because now a slightly flat note is just a wrong note. As well don't be lazy as well because what I find is that I have students come to me with a contemporary piece and all they're thinking about is the contemporary techniques but actually there's a whole piece around the contemporary techniques and you know it really actually bugs me when a student comes in and says what's the quarter tone for that fingering and I'm like what you should know you know do a little bit of your own research. It's really easy now. Go to Jason's site, you know, read a couple of books. It's not that hard to go and find a quarter tone chart now. Just Google it. Or to even, you know, have a look around for multiphonics because actually they're only the basis of a piece. And what I also find is a lot of people forget about the music that's in contemporary pieces as well. So the extended techniques are maybe five, 10% of a piece, but I would rather actually spend a lot of my lessons teaching people how to play the music yeah. because that's what audiences want to hear. Jenny, I think, oh, I, whoever, yeah. I was, gonna say, I was just I think... going to say, oh, sorry, oh, <laughs> the Zoom Jenna, interruptions. Um, I was just going to say, we're um, seeing some questions. How do I double tongue? How do I circular breathe? How do I do this extended technique? I know this is nearly mean to discuss over Zoom. This has to be done, you know, in a real studio or something somewhere. But can you do your best to explain to someone that's just starting out this process of double tonguing or circular breathing, what they need, how they should practice it? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm going to start because Gardner's wrong in his research. But uh, and, and anyway, <laughs> no, watch the videos. Just watch the videos. No, it's the, the, I'll start with double tonguing. It, it, it's um, it's just a rocking motion. I mean, uh, either a digga 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 dig or a tika 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 something like that. And the, the 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 tip of your tongue still has to hit where you hit on the tip of the reed, and then the k has to stop the air. The and and the, I've written this this whole theory thing. Bob, you muted yourself. Pardon me? <laughs> You're good. You're good. Okay. Passionate delivery. Accidental <laughs> muting. So it's a, but but I think that the, the idea is to start with something minimal on the on, on the clarinet. For me anyway, I start with a mouthpiece and barrel because it's a lot harder to squeak on a mouthpiece and barrel than it is to squeak, you know, on the whole clarinet. It's also a little less demoralizing. And then you have to get the rocking motion going. And the thing that I find most of the time that, that we teach it is it's it's they can go and they get hung up on the and they can't get back down again. So the first thing is being able to go or digga 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 and to get that feeling. The other thing is just to, to minimize the tongue motion. And if you look at some of Josh's uh, uh, videos or, or, or mine that he took of me, they the motion is is not massive. It's a small motion. And then yeah. when you get it, you just have to practice it. Go ahead, Josh. Well, and, and to add to that, I think a lot of people, when they first start to uh, trying to, to double tongue, they, they're trying to make it too tick 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 And I mean, we don't tongue like that. Um, we, you know, rarely do we ever need it to be that 
hard and and articulate. You know, when you're when your tempos where we would double tongue tend to be fast, right? So we, we want to be light and agile, and and that often means really relaxing as much as possible. Uh, and and I'd, I'd say that that's one of the biggest issues um, issues that we see, just trying to make it too too the articulation too hard. The other issue is that you know because of that that rocking motion. Again, I, I posted a, a Dropbox link uh, for you to to look at a bunch of different videos, but there's some double tonguing in there as well. Uh, that rocking motion, it, it messes up your voicing. And, and most of the time we find when we, we start, first start double tonguing in the first register, it's super easy. It sounds fine. I mean, relatively. And then as soon as we get into the second register, right around E, fourth space E, things start to go downhill really quickly because the tongue's move. It's usually moving too much. Um, and it might be moving to the, the back of the tongue might be, be moving too far forward and causing a little gliss. Um, there's a video of that as well. You can see the tongue move forward when uh, to gliss, which we, we want to avoid because, you know, we, we can double tongue on any note of the instrument. Whatever note you can play, you can double tongue on that note. But finding that right tongue motion is, is critical. Uh, so getting out of that first register is is really important for you to figure out what you can do. If you're if you're only working in the first register, you may never figure out what works higher, and then you're stuck, and that's a problem. You can also use ear um, ear plugs. Yes, yes. <laughs> and if it's too aggressive, you'll hear that in the back. And if you're getting stuck like a duck, a duck, a duck, a, then you're able to hear, oh man, I'm really slamming the back syllable. And you'll be able to refine your motion and lighten up just a little bit. I think that's a really helpful tip. Also going slowly enough that you can control it, maybe quarter note 60, not starting at 144 or something insane. Um, another thing that helps me is tonguing 16th note single tongued and then double tongued back and forth, making sure that it matches evenness and tone quality. So another way to start using it and making it sound good. Yeah, the, the slow practice can be really useful because you can hear what that back articulation sounds like really, really clearly. And that's what we, we generally dislike about double tonguing is that there's, there's a lack of, of homogeneity between the articulations, but you can smooth that out. You know, when I when I first started um, when I first started double tonguing, it, it was really easy to go fat. Um, you know, 160 felt really good. It didn't sound great, but it 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 felt easy. But if I if I brought the tempo down to 132, it was an utter wreck. Uh, so I by practice, you know, we usually start slow and 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 work faster. I had to start fast and work slow. Uh, and when I got down to like 80 or 60 or something, things started to feel really relaxed. And, and at the same time, that relaxation let me go even faster um, so that, you know, you can double tongue whatever you can tongue, whatever you need to tongue. Rachel, Rachel, could you talk a little bit about your slap thing, that video? Sure. So there are, there are actually a lot of great slap tongue videos I've seen um, recently. And I put mine up in, 2012 uh, and it's got like 90,000 views now, which it kind of blows my mind that there's 90,000 people out there that want to learn how to slap tongue. But um, I made the video because I couldn't, I couldn't figure it out and I couldn't find uh, something that I felt was really clear. I eventually figured it out on my own um, and I made a video and I just talk about like a, a three-step process for Hi, learning. I'm Rachel Yoder and today I'm going to talk about slap <laughs> and about how to Thanks, Bob, for the example of the video. Rachel <laughs> um, But you know what? Since I made the video, I think there should be a step zero. I don't remember where I saw this. Maybe somebody else does. But before, for mine, on mine, step one is just taking the reed and trying to grab it with your tongue because you got to make the suction between the tongue and the reed, right? So you're not going to be able to see it. But anyways, you grab it, uh, the, the reed with your tongue. But step zero is this. Grab the lower lip, stretch your lower lip across your teeth, grab that with your tongue, and it's a lot easier, an easier place to start because, and now everybody's doing it. Yeah, we're all like, eh. 
because the lower lip is flexible so it's a little easier to create that suction and um, it helps get out of one of the problems that people have when they first try it which is that they they're creating the suction within the whole oral cavity rather than just between the tongue and the reed and if you're doing the suction within your oral cavity you obviously can't blow air out that you need to make that slap sound so anyway step zero just see if you can make that kind of shape with your tongue and do a little slap right on your lower lip then you can try it just on the reed or like a piece a small piece of glass that's rounded that you can um, see what's going on with your tongue and then you can go on the instrument and uh, try to slap without forming your embouchure so then you're not going to get back into that kind of sucking motion in that people tend to do and then from there you can um, try actually forming your embouchure and working on your slap tongue. So that's a short version. Anybody have anything to add to that? Well, I, I was gonna say, I, I, had, I tried to slap tongue for years and I struggled and struggled and struggled. And it was working with Lucas, who's my current doctoral student and my colleague, Andy Hall, um, saxophonist. And what, what worked for me was I had to, here's the mouthpiece. I had to think about using like a thu, like T-H-O-O-O -O -O syllable. And so I like basically put the middle of the tongue on the reed and like, through so that the tongue is pushed forward by the air because I started popping the reed but it took me I mean two years to make a pitch come out I'm not proud of this now I feel comfortable slap tonguing all the time but if, if you're a person who's watching this like pour yourself your favorite hazy IPA if you're of age and like don't be afraid to lubricate socially while you teach yourself this because I mean years but for me it was really a matter of like tonguing really poorly like with the middle of the tongue and then just trying to like I mean, I broke some reeds doing this because I had to scrape. I basically think, I thought about scraping the reed down so that the tongue is like, the suction for me comes right before the, the pop. But Rachel's video is amazing. I watched it so many times. <laughs> That's awesome. I, I worked with you, Rachel, but it was, but I, I, it, it just, to, to me, I, it, I learned, you know, it, when I used to play in this orchestra in Ohio, I'd get to the, the rehearsals an hour early and sit in these dressing rooms and try to figure out what I was doing. And finally, I watched that and I thought, oh my goodness, I'm doing this all wrong. And, and that, you know, <laughs> so Andy uses a, would you say a foo syllable? Foo, yeah, it's my favorite. It's like a, a duh syllable. Duh. Oh yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah. I feel like I grabbed the read with the duh and then the ah. Uh is the air afterwards. I think I'm a ta, ta, ta. Yeah. I use a ta. See, we're all different as well. And one thing I found was when I was learning and first being told, I was being told one way. And then some of my teacher students were saying, no, nah, don't listen to your teacher, do it this way. And then someone else would be like, oh, I'll do it this way. And actually what worked for me was putting everything together and finding my own way that really, really worked. And we all have different mouth shapes, different teeth, different size tongs, everything. So, so I think just be open-minded and explore as many avenues as you can. And it's great. It's like the best thing in the world when your first slap comes out. Mm -hmm. I don't think you need a tiny one at first. And then like, yeah, and then it gets bigger and bigger. And once you've got it, it never goes. I heard Greg Oakes play that Lock Him On piece in Northwestern, and that was the day I decided I'm going to learn how to slap tongue finally once and for all. Lock Him On has a few different kinds of, of articulations, including, you know, some uh, like, and also some, some, um, some uh, tongue um, uh, flicking the reed, too. Um, but one of the things that, that was probably most helpful that I heard um, when I was first agonizing over this like it seems like all of us have um was that the first sound you're going to get isn't going to be one of these monster uh you know no stern style slaps instead you're going you're going to hear just a little you know and that's okay and and as long as it's the right motion and that you're creating it with that like rachel's talking about then then you're on the right track and then just keep on doing it like we've like we've all said yeah, use a larger reed, play on a bass reed or saxophone reed to start, 
and use a softer reed as well. And you might need to have your tongue farther forward, kind of like an anchor ton tonguing position to make it happen too. I kept a contra reed in my uh, glove compartment. And when I was on long drives, I would just... <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> the whole drive until my tongue started to feel like it was going to work. Uh, it helps me to bite a little bit too. If you like bite just a little bit when you first are doing the slap, it like for some reason it relaxes the embouchure. And I started using Leger reeds because I kept breaking the other ones, and then I shattered the tip of a Leger reed. So I thought. <laughs> <laughs> tip I have to offer is that when you're first learning to slap, keeping the jaw still. I find that's the hardest thing when you're trying to get your tongue to get the suction and keeping your embouchure still. A lot of people jump forward and then squawks. That's a some good work. How about we talk some about flutter tonguing? I saw a comment now that we've talked about, you know, slap tonguing, let's move on to flutter tongues. Any advice that you have to teach someone that maybe is struggling with that? That one's a hard one to teach, um, and uh, I, that's actually one of the hardest things for me to teach, because I remember when I was 10 going into my clarinet lesson and saying, like, hey, look what I can do, <laughs> you know, and, and so I, unlike other things, you know, that was something that I was always able to do, um, but I, I've noticed that one of the things that is especially useful is that there are a few different places, not unlike slap, where, where people find that flutter. Um, you know, the very front, like a Spanish R versus you know, more in the middle, like a, a French R or German uh, kind of sounds. And, and I think that uh, not getting restricted to the information you hear from one person um, is probably the most helpful. That combined with relaxation, because as, as we all know, as soon as you go, uh, the, the flutter goes away. If you're, if you're to the point where you can roll your R's without without the clarinet. A lot of people find that when they put the, the clarinet in their mouth, they just can't do it. A big, big reason for that is because when we roll our R's, it's, it's pretty far forward in our mouth. Then we put a clarinet in our mouth and the mouthpiece is where we would, we would flutter. And we absolutely don't want to flutter on the reed because that sounds horribly painful. Um, so figuring out how to move your tongue back a little bit on your palate to get the flutter just a little bit further back um, can can often help. And I know Bob's going to talk about something right now to also help with this. I have, I, I have, I take a lot of mouthpiece in and probably because of an overbite or something. And what I have to do is I have to literally bring the clarinet forward like that to get it out of the way. It looks really stupid. When I play Baird four pieces, it looks awful. <laughs> and I have to go like that in order to get it to work. That's just me. For my students, sometimes I'll tell them to start their normal sound first and then add the flutter later. I find there's a lot of difficulty trying to do both right at the start of the sound. So trying to master one thing at a time. So start like a sustained pitch and then add your flutter in. Try maybe something in the, the low register, the low resistance first. Yeah, you can do, you can also do the opposite. If you, if you can get a, a nice rolled R, then you can try to try to do that with just the mouthpiece in your mouth and keep your lips open, get out of where you're, you're not actually making a sound, then gradually in, form your embouchure and see if you can, can get the, the, the sound to start with the flutter as well. And you're just mixing it up as much as you can. And here's yet another case where this technique is helping people understand what's going on because uh, what you're just talking about, Josh, is keeping the setting of the embouchure muscles individuated from the, the tongue, which needs not to have the same kind of intensity. And usually I've found when people uh, are having a difficulty making the flutter, who can, who can roll their R's, uh, when they do that air thing like you're talking about, then it's fine. And so finding how you do that is going to then yield a better result in lots of other areas as well. So has anybody successfully taught someone to flutter tongue who cannot roll their R's? Because I've run into that and just gave up. There are a few things that I've known. Oh, sorry, Sarah, go ahead. I can say I actually couldn't roll my R's. So I had to teach myself to roll my R's um, before I could flutter. So I guess I taught myself to roll my R's. And I literally just walk down the street 
for weeks just going and then eventually and then I'd walk past builders and I'd be like and then I was like right now I can go and do it on clarinet so like literally I just had to figure out how to do ours and I also I had to do it as well because I went to a cathedral school and so I you know I had to sing with the choir boys and so it was just something I had to learn and yeah it's literally just spending weeks going and eventually it it did come was that before or after they let you out of the institution Uh, they never let me out the institution (laughs) you know i i have had i have had student uh, i can think of one one in particular who was able in a in a lesson was able to to roll their tongue for the first time and and it was a lot of awareness building of, of what the, what, where the tongue is, uh, you know, trying to get the tip of the tongue somewhere that is conducive to, um, to actually rolling because they, they, they'll, they'll put it too far back or they'll, they'll, they can put it on the teeth really low. Um, and then also having the right amount of tension so that when you blow across it, the, it, it can blow open and then, and then close again. There's, I think awareness is is really uh, really critical. Well, I mean, it's critical for so many of these these techniques, but with flutter tugging. Uh, well, I have to go from soft to loud. I actually have to start in the back and work forward. So I'll I'll do a start in the back and then just my flutter has always been a problem for me. Greg mentioned, uh, you know, how we we can we can use different parts of the tongue, and you can get different effects from that as well. The you know the the back flutter, which I absolutely cannot do. It's like the Wookie sound. Um, it has this, this nice like purr to it that that it's it's much gentler than uh, than the than the front flutter. And if you have control over both of them, I mean, it, it can be it can be a nice um, creative decision. Where, where you where you need to where you need to use it what kind of effect you're after and some some students also find that they can even do even further back a glottal thing which is similar to what you do if you garble mm-hmm. um, and any of those disruptions in the airflow can work um, and so if people are not able to roll their R's and they're like I've got to flutter this in two weeks uh, sometimes some of those techniques can also be helpful to create the sound while somebody is also in the process of maybe learning some of the additional ones. You know, what's um, really interesting about this whole discussion, it's just really bringing home that there's no one way to do any one technique, isn't it? And I think it's so important to get this message across. It's like you might have a lesson with someone who says, try it this way that might never work for you. So, you know, go to somebody else and and somebody else. And I know at times over the past year, I've said to Jason, who, um, Jason Older, who's also, he's my PhD student, my colleague as well, he's my PhD student. And I said, oh, will you come and help explain slap tongue? Because both um, Jason and I do slap tongue in completely different ways. And I think as a good teacher as well, you should never be afraid to say, okay, I'm going to get somebody else to come in to explain it their way. And so even with teaching multiphonics or slap tongue, which I think are kind of some of my strong points, I don't necessarily consider myself an expert teacher all the time with them. And maybe some of uh, the others have got stuff they want to add to follow from that. That's, I mean, that's a brilliant thing. I think that what's one of the things with this panel is helpful is to see that people will come to the same conclusion from different ways. I saw that Albert in the Q&A had asked a question about uh, shakuhachi and Dene technique, and I thought that would be an interesting thing to talk about because it's one of the things that I absolutely adore. The Mendat folk songs um, does that in folk movement. And uh, um, so for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, by the way, um, the shakuhachi technique is when you take the barrel off and you're making an emblem flute sound. Um, and uh, in the Man that folk songs, he, he writes specific fingerings to get uh, sounds that, that end up sounding tonal, even though you know this part of the instrument is gone. So if you just do the regular fingerings, um, the, the proportions are off. Um, but the real thing about that, if, if somebody is trying to figure out that sound, is you're, you're not just blowing across it like a bottle, by the way. 
um, you're, you're covering up a good amount of the top with your, with your bottom lip and then creating a tiny little aperture and blowing it right at the edge like a, a thipple. Um, I've never done the nay technique though. I don't know, you know, this one. I don't know if any of you have experience with that one. We have several students that have done it that way. I can't do it that way. I, I'm always in front of me. Yeah. So this might be a good time to segue into the next portion of this panel, which is talking about commissioning new music. I know there's so much to say about extended techniques, but I think there's also a lot to say about the process of commissioning new music. I think we've already talked about why it's important, but if anyone wants to talk about that, how you approach commissioning a new piece, any advice you have for someone else that wants to do that, please step in. Well, I, I wanted to start by saying, I think one of the reasons we commission new music is because we're committed to the canon as it exists, but what we really want to be doing is playing the music of the canon of like the year 2060 and then 2100 and then 2160. Like we want to be thinking ahead as to what are the important pieces that will add to the conversation throughout history. And it's not that we're throwing out Bach and Brahms and Beethoven, it's that we're trying to figure out, like the musicologists can decide what's good, fine. But I feel like our opportunity is to like, get as much music written now by a diversity of voices so that hopefully the canon is going to be more interesting, more diverse over time. And, and over time, a piece like folk songs is probably going to replace other pieces that are in the solo clarinet canon. And that's, that's great. Like, I think that's a good thing. And hopping on to what you're saying, Andy, I think if you are a commissioner, it is your moral obligation to find a representative cross-section of, of people. If you are doing a set of commissions and they all end up being white guys, you're doing it wrong. And if you're like, well, these are just the ones I knew. It's like, well, yeah, that's the problem. And so you need to make sure that if you're commissioning, that you're paying attention to that. Um, something that I've quietly been doing for a while um, is every performance that I, I'm doing, I'm making sure that there is a, is a balance of women um, who have written these pieces and then consequently not talking about it. In fact, this might be the first time I'm kind of tipping my hands, um, but just saying like, yes, this is a, you know, this is a, uh, you know, this is a fantastic piece by Suzanne Farron. Um, here's a premiere by Lisa Atkinson. Um, and, and I just, I think it's important that we do that. And then we don't, we don't look for laurels for doing the right thing. And the same thing um, for uh, composers who are people of color, um, LGBTQ. Um, I think we need to we need to be doing that actively and consciously as as uh, we're looking at this process, and that needs to be part of the very very beginning. One of the things that I've done in terms of just purely logical and trying to get composers at the beginning was to to find young composers that really are, are, are looking like they have an incredible future to them, grabbing them at, at one point and it's, it's like catching a rising star. And I mean, we, we have, we all know who Teresa Martin is because Griffin was on the list. And I was really lucky, Teresa was my clarinet student and I was really lucky that at one point I said, uh, I, would you write me a piece? And that started evolving into her writing all this clarinet music and, and she's a clarinetist too. And the same, you know, catching somebody when they're on their way up is just incredible. I got subtrains written for me. You know that story. I, I, I paid $75 for that commission. And there was alcohol involved too. But, but it, was, it was getting Eric at a point where he was just exploding. And, and I think that that's one of the things to look for for all of us is to look for composers that, that are, are rising. And along Greg's thing, and then I'm done, is that in – at the Clarence Commission in 1991, I played a recital, and afterwards, somebody came up to me and said, "That was a brilliant idea," and I thought, "Yeah, it's pretty good music," but I didn't realize. And then a long while late after that, this person came up and said, "Yes, he just played a whole recital of composers that were women," and the funny thing was, I didn't know it until then. <laughs> I just knew it was really hard. It was scaring the hell out of me, but it was just you know at that point. So I do think that we have a, a, an obligation at this point to, to look beyond the specifics of like what you say, Greg, de dead white guys. But I, I, I think that it's, we, we do need to look beyond that and to see what we have. And I do think it's our duty to, to do that as, as performers and, and, and to try to push things forward. 
I think um, recently as well, I've looked into why and what I'm commissioning. Um, and over the past few years, funding, certainly in the UK, has been incredibly tight and it's going to get worse. I mean, basically, we're pretty much bankrupt over here now. <laughs> we have to COVID. And, you know, the money's going to get redirected into other priority projects. Um, so what I found over the past few years is that actually thinking about why and what I'm commissioning has really helped me get good commission funds recently. Um, so one of them um, was the 10 We Drams project that I did, um, which was celebrating 10 years of base courses on the Scottish Island of Brasse and I wanted to commission 10 short pieces and um, we called 10 wee drams because there's a whiskey distillery on the island um, but each piece is about heritage and culture and the landscape so it's really written about the island and the Hebrides and Scotland and that really appealed to the funders which was um, the Scottish Arts Council because um, all funders have priority areas and often arts, culture and um, at the moment um, stuff like Black Lives Matter Did she freeze for everybody else? <laughs> I just love Zoom. <laughs> well, hopefully Sarah will come back, but just to cover some basics, perhaps. Oh, she's back. Ah, have I gone? Did I go? I'm you sorry. were gone for about two a minute. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's everything. Where did you get to? Contem um, contemporary causes like Black Lives Matter, and then uh, yeah, yeah. I Josh, I think her Wi-Fi cut your disease. I'll hand COVID through the. <laughs> you you disappeared again, Sarah. <laughs> She's gone on mute. I was just going to say that commissioning can, for students or people who haven't commissioned any works before, it can be as simple. There doesn't, we should always try to pay our composers and pay them well. But if you're students, it can be as simple as just asking someone, are you interested in writing a piece for me and getting started that way, working with composers. Um, and then if, uh, if you're ready to actually put some money into getting new works performed. There have been uh, commissioning projects, consortiums of people who have all put in, you know, $50 uh, in order to be able to pay a composer really a living wage that they deserve in order to create a piece of music. And then everyone who contributes can um, have first rights to perform the work for the first year or things like that. I don't know if anybody's been a part of those in the past and can speak to the specifics and maybe post a link. I've done a bunch of those and, and we've just, uh, sorry, Josh, uh, I've done a bunch of those and it's just been uh, putting in a certain amount of money and yeah, then you have the, the rights along the years. I think it's a great idea. And it also then pools our resources. So another kind of contrast to that is, uh, is when you do have that, then you end up having a composer who ends up not writing for any one person because there's so many people. And so kind of a, as a, a complement to that is the idea of forming a long-term relationship with composers. I've worked with a few composers individually for many years um, and they've written some pieces um, that uh, I mentioned Ken Wayno. He wrote pieces that he intended just to be for me because you know we were just doing these things. And then other people have come along and, and done those. And so there's the other idea where you end up working with somebody because you get to know them and, and you know each other really well and, and the way that you work together can actually be really uh, an excellent part of the process. I'd like to take just a, a, a quick step back and then we'll re return to the, the, the funny thing. Rachel mentioned something about um, students uh, commissioning and, and you know the obvious issues with, with uh, funding. Um, for them, but one of, one of the big benefits of, of encouraging your students to, to commission as, as much as they can is it can be really liberating to, for them to, to work with a composer for the first time um, and to bring a piece in that no one has heard 
that you know there's there's no recording for them to go listen to their their interpretation can be can be theirs it, it, they can own it um that's that's a really powerful thing i i know i know it is it, it was for me and and many of our students are are actively commissioning often from their peers and and it's 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 a great experience um for them to come in with with a new piece but the funding can be can be a challenge because you don't always have composers willing um, or, or able to, um, you know, as they should. I mean, it's it's what they do for a living uh, to compose for for free or or even even uh, modest amounts. Yeah, we have gotten creative lately about fundraising. Um, we have a holiday party that we host every season or every uh, December where we charge patrons you know, $25 or $35, and it includes a concert in a, in a big house with um, catered hors d'oeuvres and wine, and we end up making a few thousand dollars on that event every year, and that's a nice little pool for um, commissioning. Also, we have a project right now where we're making a recipe book with about five or six other music groups in the Phoenix area, and um, we're all compiling recipes and um, I think it's going to cost us only a few dollars per book to print, but then we can sell it, you know, for 15 to $20 and all that money can go right back into commissioning for those ensembles or recording or whatever projects they have. Um, being able to sell swag like shirts and well, creating a brand yeah, for yourself. Yeah, just I mean, being able to have resources like that. So that you do have pools of money for those composers. And it's also, you know, it, it, the importance of developing not only a relationship with composers, but a relationship with your community can be really critical. I mean, we've, we, we have a few um, hardcore patrons who like, I want to pay for a new piece for you. And they, they will pay for the commission. They'll pay for the recording. Um, you know, they, they can, they can really help um, in this regard quite a bit because it, Commissioning can get really expensive. Funding is hard to find. Yeah, and I, I think just being up up front with the composers is so helpful. Just when when I commissioned my first clarinet quartet, it was because I went to Lisa Oberlander complaining there were no good clarinet quartets, and she said, "Stop whining or commission something new." And so we emailed uh, Jim David, who teaches at Colorado State, amazing composer, and we said we don't have any money. She said, "Well, then you tell him that." And so we wrote to him and said, "We don't have any money. Would you write us a piece?" And I mean, this is a funny story, I didn't hear back. And six months later, like three weeks before the concert, got an email, dear Andy, here's your piece. Tell Lisa I love her, Jim. And we had three weeks to learn this crazy piece. But I think like, if you're just up front with composers, like this is the funding I have, or what would it cost for this kind of piece? Or I don't have any money. Is there anything else you'd like? Or should I come back to you when I have money? I find that composers, like sometimes I, I wrote to a composer once and said, I could offer you 300 bucks for this piece. He said, you know what's better than that? Could you get the festival where you're playing it at to program my band piece that's never been performed? And I was like, you don't want the money? He's like, I want my band piece recorded. Like, I need a recording of it. Okay. <laughs> so I wrote to the conductor, would you please program this piece? And that's what that composer wanted. And I'm just, I'm just here to serve them, you know? And so, so I think being really open and also just letting them guide with what they need. They'll be honest with you if you, if you give them a chance to, I find. It's, it can be safe to just tell them. Sometimes just asking them. Um, and Bill Smith was in town in Phoenix and I was taking him out to the mountains. And I was talking about all these composers that had written for me and, and, and Bill looked at me and he said, why haven't you ever asked me to write something? And I thought, well, because you're William O. Smith. <laughs> and he said, well, I'll write you a piece. And I said, well, how much would it be? And it was something, I don't know. He just really wanted to write something and it was a negligible amount and I paid him and it was just, and I got a piece by him. So I think sometimes just asking People want to be creative, and, I, and particularly now during this time, I think it's a really hard time for all the composers too. I mean, their, their work has just plummeted down, and, and we can still do it. Looking through the chat here, there was, uh, Ian had asked about, you know, as a composer, how do you get out there? And that works both ways. Ian, you can go out and find people. Um, I, I would suggest finding people who already are playing adventurous kinds of things, are interested in, and, um, if you say you're starting out, I don't know if you're a student, um, but uh, you know, finding people who are at a similar stage to you and just asking, you know, like, hey, could 
could I work with you? And that's one of the things too, not just like working on your own, writing a piece and then having someone do it. The interaction, you've heard me say this a couple of times already in this, the interaction I think is one of the most amazing parts of, of this the process. Um, I just did a, a thing uh, with, a, with a group of composition doctoral students um, who had each written pieces for my uh, quarter tone extended clarinet. And I told them, talk to me, we'll, let's work together. And some people were really with that and, you know, hey, I'm, I have this, can we, can we do this? What, what is happening with this? And I, fi I find that the pieces were really much more effective when there was a back and forth going on. And so just, you know, composers too, don't be afraid to ask, find people and, you know, maybe you hear somebody that you really like, you know, like, Bob Spring's amazing. Let me see if, if I wrote him a piece, what he would do. And, and you know, you won't know if you don't ask. Yeah, and just to tag on to that, uh, the idea of what value can you offer the composer, sometimes the performance is more valuable than money if you're not able to offer a lot of money. And also recording, if, <clears throat> if you have the resources to create a recording, that can help them publicize their works and get more performances of the works. Uh, composers get, they can get a check from BMI or ASCAP for every performance that you do if you if you especially send them the concert program and make sure that they know uh, when it was performed, they can get a lot of money from if, you know, a few people take up the piece and start performing it around. But we should also mention grant writing, which is hard um, in a lot of places, especially in the US, because we don't have a lot of government funding for the arts, but there are a lot of local organizations and uh, sometimes even just at the city level that might be willing uh, to fund your project if you write a great grant for it. I think as well it's it's jumping into every situation that kind of happens and we're in this really strange COVID situation at the moment with the pandemic but in a way I think new music could come out of this really positively. Have I frozen again or am I I'm okay? I think we could potentially come out of this really well because as new musicians we're constantly looking at new ways to create you know we're we're ready to go online we work with electronics and we're constantly producing new stuff and actually there is a lot of funding creeping up out there looking at the effects of COVID in the arts or research grants where you could link into science or a whole you know variety of stuff so I think we can look quite negatively on the whole COVID situation or we could think, okay, this is an opportunity to really shout out about what we can do with contemporary music. And maybe, you know, it's, it's our time as contemporary musicians to take the platform for a few months. Yeah, I love that idea, Sarah. Oh. And I just, I think that we, like those of us who play contemporary music, this is our chance to really because if you right now, somebody like Ian is a young composer. I bet somebody in that chat right now would love to play a brand new piece by Ian live on Facebook in four weeks. So somebody jump on that. But like we have this chance to commission a piece for me in my office alone with piano resonance, you know, or me in my room with children being loud in the living room accompaniment or whatever. And so I think this is a chance for us to really take advantage of the access we have into each other's homes and into each other's lives. Because I, I love hearing live music, even if it's over Zoom right now, because it's, it's the only thing I get. So yeah, don't, this is an opportunity for us to be creative. And, and I mean, we're not getting paid to play right now from our rooms. Maybe, maybe we don't have funding to pay composers to write right now, but there might be some of you who want to pair up with someone you know, and you could each benefit from a shared experience. Maybe this is something that the ICA could make a list of. Maybe if some of the composers in the audience want to send in their names and some young clarinetists do, maybe we can help pair you up. Um, it would be really, really easy to do. Sorry to power work on you all. <laughs> and Not that, a problem. I'm writing all these ideas down. Yeah, but, you know, this is, this is what happens. And this would be great. They could be posted on the ICA Facebook page, website. You know, make the pieces about the situation we're in. Let's look at, you know, the science and get some facts around it. And it doesn't have to just be for solo clarinet. It could have speech. It could have some basic accompaniment. If, you know, somebody has... Well, we've got, we've got a duo here. We've got Josh and Steffi. 
So there's so many things as, as new musicians we could do, so why not do it? The new music gathering each year, um, one of the, the big events uh, there is the uh, composer performer speed dating, where you know people have a chance to sort of get to know each other just really briefly. Um, and, uh, and you know, that actually uh, is, is a really interesting way to start to understand uh, somebody else's body of work. But if you're a composer, you can do a same, the same kind of thing with, you, with all the messages you're sending out into the world, saying like, I'm a composer, I would love to work with a performer who has, you know, the, the product as the main interest right now if, they're, if you know, they don't have funding. And you might find a performer who's trying to do the same thing. Um, and so this is a way to get around the money thing if you just find two people who have that same goal. And just, it's a matter of just putting it out there. And so if you're sitting and hoping that you're gonna find it, um, less likely to happen. This is an issue that, that is affecting everybody. Large ensembles, orchestras, bands. I mean, they're, they're all trying to figure out what, what they can program in the fall. And, and students still you know, get um, a quality experience out of it that's gonna be useful to them. So it, it, there, there is certainly opportunity uh, right now for, uh, for such pieces across the board. And I hate to do this. This has been such a wonderful panel. I think this is a really great discussion that we're all having, but if anyone has any final advice they'd like to share, any final questions, type them into the chat, but final remarks. It's a terrible time. <laughs> and we, we all have to work through this. And I always, I'm telling people right now, particularly my students, that this is the time where if you keep working and keep working, it's survival of the fittest. If you keep working and keep working, when this ends, we're going to be at, at a better point than those people who have given up. And it is survival of the fittest. It's, it's, it's the people who keep pushing, keep pushing. Now is your chance to do that. Yeah, I think it, it's the time to be open-minded as well. And it's the time to not only practice your orchestral excerpts, but to learn some new music, learn solo music, you know, look at your careers. What am I going to do in two years time? And I think those of us who are open-minded and experiment, commission and kind of say yes to everything are probably going to be the people that manage to come out of this the strongest. So be open-minded and try lots of things out. Yeah, this is really the time to learn, you know, what, yeah, that one thing or however many things that you just didn't think you had time to do. Now's the time to do it. Yeah, and I would just encourage everybody that, I mean, all, all music and all techniques were new at some point. So, like, who, who knows what will be standard tomorrow and in, and in five and ten years. So, yeah, this, this is your chance to create the future of our industry. And if you think we need more equity, then, then go get it. Like it's not everyone else's job to fix it. It's our job, all of us. And so we have to take the steps to build the world that we want to live in. So I just encourage everybody to go out there and, and just try it, just see what happens. Like if they say no, great, that's fine. But I think it's better to ask. Okay, if no one else has anything to say, I want to thank all of the wonderful panelists for sharing their knowledge, their expertise, all their really helpful advice. This has been really exciting for me and I hope everyone watching has really enjoyed this half as much as I have. Um, I just want to announce that we have one more panel today for ICA Plays On. The panel is at five o'clock Eastern time and that is clarinet care, repair and maintenance. So if you haven't already done so, make sure that you go to the website um, clarinet.org and you click on ICA Plays On 2020. You can register for that panel. It's not too late. We have a full day of panels tomorrow and Sunday and we hope to see you all there.